spinning wheel. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Deep in the Bush. There's been a bit of a hiatus over various festivals that have been going on. I'm sure you've heard of some of them. Um, but I'm very, very pleased to be back and very pleased to be welcoming on a new friend, Sergio Villa. Did I get your surname pronunciation correct? I hope so. Yes. Uh, that's how new we are as, as friends here. Uh, everybody in the world of conservation, I think, immediately are friends until they start talking about conservation and then somehow they become enemies. <laughs> but so far, we're doing really, really well. I've got a very brief introduction just to say that Sergio has got a fascinating background, uh, born, raised in Mexico, and began his studies there as a biologist researching jaguars. And jaguar conservation was a true conservation biologist in the field where conservation was needed. And then life threw a curveball. And I'll let Sergio, I'll let you explain that further because it's it's your fantastic story. Uh, gracias, Peter. Uh, buenos dias. Thank you so much for this invitation and the opportunity to connect. Uh, yeah, I am Sergio Avila. I'm originally from Mexico. I was born in Mexico City so many decades ago. I, I stopped counting after five. Um, and uh, I am the type of person who grew up dreaming to become a wildlife biologist to study and protect big cats. I feel that that is something is relatable to a lot of people, for sure, a lot of your audience. But you know, beyond the person I am with degrees and professional background, I am somebody's son, I am somebody's brother, husband, uncle, I am a runner. Uh, I am, as they say over here in the States, a crazy cat person. And something very important I want to share here, I am a frustrated footballer. The reason why I am a wildlife biologist is because I could not have a career in football. Uh, and I am talking about the real football, not the American football. The one that's played the one, around the world, yes. The one that yeah. is uh, commonly known, uh, uh, you know, where we use our feet to play with our ball, not the one where we use helmets and pads and never use our feet uh, you know i'm i'm a, rug, I'm a rugby guy and uh, i was i played it and again if you talk about frustrated i mean i'm five foot nine for a start not great nice. for rugby and also hopelessly uncoordinated um i i if my parents weren't from different countries i'd be sure they were cousins uh that's how bad it is so yeah but anyway i i understand that not being good at sport when you want to be uh but please do carry on yeah. so because of that, I wasn't good enough for what I really wanted to do in life. I followed the other passion I had, which was, was science, uh, which was uh, cats. And with that, um, I also want to say that I was privileged to grow up with parents who are scientists. My parents are medical doctors in Mexico. Uh, I have one brother who is also a wildlife biologist. Um, okay. So that is to say that I grew up surrounded by science, science as a language, science as a way of making decisions, science as the form in which my parents interacted with people. So a lot of this grew into my uh, eventual academic career and studies on Jaguars. And, and you were why, talking about go ahead, go ahead. Why, why, I mean, I... I think for so many people, like myself, as I just explained, I grew up in Australia. So my exposure to big cats, there's obviously no big cats in Australia, was entirely documentaries and the occasional trip to the zoo. In my head, jaguars were a jungle animal. Uh, but you're going to tell me otherwise, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Uh, but however, uh the first part is similar. I was also in contact with zoos, encyclopedias, a few nature shows, because in the 70s, really, in Mexico, we didn't have very much nature shows. Uh, but like I said, my parents were so connected to science um, and literature that it was through books that I related to animals in the beginning. Where I grew up in Mexico, the state of Zacatecas, uh, there was a very small zoo that situation there where animals were in concrete and wire cages, very small containers. Uh, however, there was, a, there was an African lion there. And I remember going to see it several times. I remember 
feeling sad for this animal in a cage. But I also remember having this, I don't want to say connection, but just feeling different around this animal. Um, it's a privilege just to be in their presence, sadly in a zoo, but still. One thing that I realized it took me years to understand was that this lion used to roar and you could hear it through town. Yeah. And I and I yeah. never realized that it was not just seeing the lion, it was hearing the lion and knowing, oh, there's a lion roaring, <laughs> right? And so, so that you could hear that I, from your home, could you? Pretty much, yeah. Oh wow, right. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, a, a little bit closer, but yes, basically, you know, like yeah. we didn't have to go very far. It was another place we a park we visited and we could hear it from there. Yeah, so great. I realized that that had an influence where I started having dreams that we had a lion, an African lion in my backyard. And the dream was recurring, was very repetitive. The lion was big. I could touch the lion's mane and stroke the mane here. I used to feed chicken to this lion. So it was in my dreams, you know, like this idea starts um, solidifying in your brain. And um Yes, I also grew up thinking that jaguars uh, were jungle cats only. And it's not only because of what we grow up thinking, like you said, but it's because of what we hear in on TV, in the news, in the documentaries, in the encyclopedias. It's because the information comes through the lens of somebody else who says jaguars live in jungles, right? Yeah. Um, However, fast forward these 40 years, I come to be part of a jaguar project in northern Mexico, which is a more arid desert kind of landscape than the tropical jungles of central southern Mexico and into uh, Central America and, and South America. And so uh, in the early 2000s, scientists started photographing and finding evidence of jaguars living in what is known as the U.S. Southwest and the Mexico Northwest, this, this shared region of mountains, deserts, valleys. Uh, you know, uh, it really doesn't matter if it's Southwest United States or Northwest Mexico, it's the same place. So yeah. which, which U.S. states are we talking? We are talking about Arizona and New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So from California, which is a reference point for a lot of people, mm. move uh, uh, a couple hundred kilometers east and you get yeah. to the large state of Arizona and New Mexico. But hey, in my studies with jaguars, this is very important. I found out the very important fact that jaguars actually don't care if they are in the United States or in Mexico. For them, this being mm. Arizona doesn't matter. They don't give uh, anything about it. They don't care about it. They care about the food, they care about prey, they care about water, they care about habitat and corridors. Um, so it is, uh, I just want to start with that, that it is this mental idea that we have to locate animals within a political uh, boundary that humans created. Jaguars live in the mountains, jaguars have the habitat, and it happens to be some of it in Mexico in a tiny bit in the most northernmost distribution in the United States. They but historic, were, historically, they were they were much further into the United States. Correct. I mean, how far how far up did they get? Um, as far as we know from records, not only uh, uh, observations or even hunting records, which is what comes before the scientific observations. As far as we know, they were north as far as the Grand Canyon in wow. the beginning of the 1900s. And the Grand Canyon, for reference, would be about I'm going to say a thousand kilometers from the U.S.-Mexico border. So it is yeah. far, right? Um, and there, there there, were records, I think, in 1902 of a female and two cubs that were hunted uh, around that year. But we also have to keep an eye on indigenous uh, science, indigenous records, indigenous Native American, Native stories, uh, art and drawings, paintings that depict jaguars. And we can tell that jaguars were in this region way before the 1900s and pretty much um, moved across the continent uh, freely for, for, for many years, for, for a long time. So, so do you, was, yeah, go ahead. 
I mean, I, I think of that, that amazing swampy environment in Florida, in the Everglades. They never managed to arc across to there. That's because that's just to me, says, oh, that just looks like there should be jaguars in there. But I mean, if you consider them in the Pantanal where they seem just most at home, but they never got that far, did they? I think not that we know, because here's okay. another piece that I want to say about being a scientist. We think that things only exist if they're written in Western science. We think that mm -hmm. records only exist if somebody wrote it in a journal. But I want to say we don't know uh, because we do know about jaguars in the uh, swampy areas of New Orleans and other areas oh. in the south close oh, enough to Florida. So it does make yes. sense that they were in Florida. But if we start thinking about history or animal records, in the 1800s, then we are living thousands of years behind with no record. It's not yeah. like the records didn't exist. It's that we as scientists are not acknowledging those. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely. And I think there's, there is a great, if slow, shift occurring in science. And I say this as a non-scientist, but a, I observe science as passionately as I observe wildlife. It's, it's my teacher. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I, I sometimes feel bad. And I was speaking to a, a, a revered predator science in Africa recently. And I said, do you hate us safari guides where you spend four years on a PhD and then we turn it into a punchline? Like we distill it to one line to excite tourists. And to his credit, he actually said, no, this is, if, if our work is getting out there, we're thrilled. But that is, as you pointed out, that is a Western type of science or a um, developed world type of science where it's it's very competitive, it's very ego-driven, it's very macho. It seemed yeah. you always hear publish or perish. Exactly. You want to stay in academia, you've got to keep putting out new papers or you're irrelevant. And that doesn't seem to be about bettering the world or bettering knowledge. And I think this is something that you're passionate about and, and you're trying to perhaps educate people about in a a non-Western way. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. In fact, uh, when you started describing this, you used the word revered uh, uh, scientist, somebody super well yeah. recognized, right? Like, yeah. I hate that too. I hate that too, because we build ourselves as scientists, as the experts, right? Like we build ourselves as the one who knows more than everybody else, the one who has published the books and spoken at conferences and received the awards, and very importantly, received the funding from the foundations. And so that is part of this struggle too, that uh, science, you said you grew up around science, I grew up around science. Science is a tool, like a hammer, like a drill, mm -hmm. like a car. Mm -hmm. But this tool is only useful according to the way you use it, right? We yes. know about yeah. science produced by the fuel industry in the 70s that pointed towards climate change, and they hit that science. So science as a tool can be manipulated. Yeah. And yeah. scientists as people are very limited. We might be very deep in our knowledge, but we are very narrow in that knowledge. So to speak about the curveball, you know, that, that you referred to earlier mm -hmm. is very quick. I went into uh, college. I got my wildlife biology degree. I got graduate degree uh, also on research um, wildlife studies. I work with mountain lions or pumas. I work with jaguars, with ocelots. So I was following this trajectory of what is the typical scientist conservation career, uh, where you believe that running research through years uh, using whatever method you are using, you publish papers, and that is what's going to affect conservation. So we always look for that sort of success story of what did you discover, uh, what is new, you know, which then the media kind of uh, just minimizes to a headline, right? Like research of many years, like you said, minimized to a headline. And that's one thing. But the other part that we haven't talked about is the local communities that live in those places, people who are not scientists, people who don't have degrees, and people who certainly don't read the journal of Jaguar conservation, and yeah. so and for whom the answer to certain questions 
needs to be a little bit faster than waiting for you to peer review your paper and wait for comments and then send, submit, you know, all that scientific uh, world stuff that we do. So as I'm following my own uh, typical science career, uh, the curveball that life threw at me uh, was that first, the great pitch was I capture jaguars and was able to radio color jaguars in an area uh, of their distribution in the continent where it has never been done before, in arid lands, in, in desert mountains, grasslands, not in the jungle. So that was new because as scientists, our knowledge was so limited that we thought jaguars were in the Amazon basin, Central America, and a little bit in Southern Mexico. Turns out jaguars have been around these Northern regions for, for millennia and now we're finding through science that they are sharing space with mountain lions, with, with pumas. They are sharing prey and they are adapting to a completely different environment in humidity, in density, in space. And that, that makes these jaguars be a little different, the north, what we call the northern jaguars. The curveball is that while I was hoping to inform all this uh, new information about jaguars, and capturing a jaguar, one jaguar died uh, as a result of one of these captures. And that, in all the stories, in the encyclopedias, in the zoos, in the documentaries, you never hear about that. You only hear about the scientists who succeeded, but you never hear about the scientists who failed. So for me, after 25 years of wanting to be the scientist, of wanting to run the research project, of wanting to discover, inform, come up with new ways of conservation. Turns out that by trying to be that person, jaguars died in my hands. Not exactly in my hands, but it was my responsibility. That affected me very deeply uh, because that was not something you expect. You know, you got to you got to be a doctor to cure people, not for people to die on your table. You go to <clears throat> be somebody in order to do the positive side of it. So I had to go through the very sad part of not only losing a jaguar, but then all the human conflict, all the egos, all the funding, all the interests that come through that. And you actually also come to discover who people are. Uh, the yeah. scientist who was my hero, the scientist who inspired uh, a lot of my academic career turned out to be a complete a-hole when it came to conflict, when it came to his ego, uh, and when it came to him defending himself, he was comfortable sending me to jail because of the death of that cat instead of making himself responsible for everything that came uh, to that moment. I didn't go to jail, but it was a very difficult time. So that was the curveball. I had to learn that as much as a scientist, as much as a, uh, the love that I put to protect animals, animals might not want to be studied like that. Animals don't want to be captured in a, in a snare or in a cage. Animals don't want to be under anesthesia. Animals don't want to have something hanging from their neck and an airplane following them where they live in remote areas. So who am I to decide that this is the way to do it? Who am I to say that capturing one or two jaguars and getting all this information that will make me look good will actually help jaguars? So I left that career. I lost my opportunity to do a PhD. I lost con connection with these scientists. I, in fact, left my career for a few months maybe years. I didn't want to be a biologist anymore. I didn't want to study cats anymore. I wanted to go and ride bicycles. And it was a very sad time. It was, it was confronting failure in a way that you didn't expect it to, ha to happen. And then, as you know, life takes you on a different path. Um, and I follow that path. So that, I mean, I think it's fantastic that you speak about it. As you said, you rarely hear of scientific failures or, or regret mm -hmm. uh, i mean you, you do always hear that science the the nobel prize and all of these other things yep. they're not given for the answer but for the question that was asked right but <clears throat> what they don't often talk about are the missteps along the way and i've observed this i've seen with lion researchers and i was in an area of 
one of the more pristine habitats in the whole of Africa, I believe, the Okavango Delta. And right smack bang in the middle of it. No humans apart from the tourism operation. And it was a, a very small footprint operation, a uh, maximum of 18 tourists in the whole area and three times as many staff as that. So in a huge area. And a lion researcher came in. There's an antelope there called the Red Lechwe. And every place he was going to set up to count lions, he would shoot one. And to me, it was a travesty. Now, they, these things, you... you you could have walked up and shot them with a pistol. You wouldn't have needed a rifle because that. And to me, it was a breach of trust, which we had developed and, and earned. You don't, wildlife very rarely gives you trust. And I, that was when I had my first questions about the methodology of science and, and to what aim was this? And as it ultimately turned out, this guy was co-funded by um, Safari Club International, there you go. Big, were and so he was part of the money is in there, and they say, of course, there's no strings attached. But can you prove, rather than give us some numbers, can you prove that uh, lions in this supposedly in the, in the unhunted area are at a lower population than the areas where we do hunt? They were trying to prove that hunting actually bolsters populations, which is, of course what the Romans called Taurus excreta. Um, and, and and it was, so we actually had a few antelopes shot so that they could prove they should shoot more lions. And I just thought, oh, this, I was dismayed by it, absolutely dismayed by it, and, and still am to this day. And it does feel like a lot of that still goes on. And I, I'm pro-science, big fan of science, vaccinated, all of those good things. But... I do think we should still be asking questions. So I'm so glad that you've done that. Where did this curveball, uh, tragic curveball, take you? Well, <clears throat> one took me to the immediate response of dissociating, not wanting to be a researcher, embarrassment, sadness. Um, I actually, to be honest, it took me 12 years to be able to talk about this. It took me 12 years to tell the story to people outside of that circle uh, and to realize that that story had value in itself for other younger people like me not to go make the same mistake. Uh, that if you care about jaguars or anything, that antelope you just described, if you care about uh, the life of these animals as a species, not just as an individual, maybe it's better for you to not be so hands-on, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe maybe um, you need to think about your career as a wildlife biologist, not based on how many publications and how many diplomas you get, but based on what is the impact to those populations, human and natural populations in those places. You might not need a degree to do that. Right, Peter? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so where it took yeah. me, it took me after that, I started working again. I was invited to work in an organization where I brought in my knowledge and skills about uh, Jaguar research in the field. Uh, and that's what brought me to the United States. That's how I came to the United States. I came invited as a Jaguar researcher to continue monitoring uh a couple individuals that were crossing the border and be were being photographed in some mountains uh, here in Arizona, close to the border. And so through that project, I focused more on collecting sign, track and sign, identifying track and sign than actually seeing the Jaguars. So we use a lot of those remote cameras, those trail cameras <laughs> that you know well. And we used a lot of tracking. This is the track of a Jaguar here in Arizona taken in 2004. This is a big cast we made. Would you mind putting your hand up next to it? Just so get a... Wow, okay, yeah, that's a big pug, isn't it? That's a, is that a front foot? That's a front, right, yes. Yeah. 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 It's a front foot. foot. And um, it is a round track, round toes, big planter pad, three lobes in the bottom. Uh, it's so round that it's almost the same measures in both ways or even wider. So it can be like 10 centimeters wide, nine centimeters long. Okay. Uh, and, and cougars, uh, uh, pumas, 
are more or less nine by nine, but their shape is different. So at least here, even if you have never seen a Jaguar track, the day you see one, you know it's a Jaguar track, which right. I suspect might be the case uh, if I go to a country in Africa and I look at cat tracks, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I suspect I will be able to tell which one is the lion <laughs> without ever having Yeah, I mean, a lion size gives it away, but it's, it's when you see a leopard track, you go, is this a, a big leopard or a small lion? And again, there is a difference in shape. And it sounds crazy, but the, the lion track is somehow more masculine. It's more butch and the, the, the leopard track is soft. It's very, very round. Again, leopard track is much rounder. Um, cheetah track is weird, three lobes. Yeah, cheetahs. Again, it's a, it's a more rectangular or oblong, to use an old-fashioned yeah. word, and it has the claw marks. And you see the, uh, the claws, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's – but uh, uh, sometimes you see you know, a really big male leopard who's still smaller than a jaguar, of yeah. course. Yeah, But you look um, and you think – So this is interesting because that's where life took me. You and I are talking about right now about – an ancient skill of tracking and identifying sign, animal sign. This is this can be Western science, but this is an old science that has existed for millennia in local communities throughout the world. Mm -hmm. For people who kind of need to know the tracks of what they are going to eat or what could eat them, right? It, it, this is simplistic, yeah. but that's pretty much it. And so I realized that there was other ways of studying animals that did not require uh, capturing, handling, and much less funding. And that by using these non-invasive techniques like the cameras and track and sign, we could reach a broader area. We could have more people than only scientists. So I was training dozens and dozens of volunteers to be tracking out in the wild in this region to look for bears, pumas, jaguars, ocelots, wolves, coyotes, coatis, so many other species. And that was also a method that helped us to monitor species beyond just the cat because a radio collar only gives you information about the animal with the radio collar. Right. And I don't think that in conservation, we should be making decisions about a species based on a sample of one or two, right? Like if you really want to affect conservation of a species and you need to understand that species, then you might have to do a hundred radio colors and nobody wants to manage that. Well, maybe some might want to manage that, but it's expensive, it takes a long time, it is difficult, it is risky, it is a lot of things. But if you train people who are out there already enjoying these places, who are looking at tracks, who are looking at birds, who are looking at the habitat, who are keeping birds, climatological records, or other observations, you are expanding a network of uh, volunteer scientists who are collecting information about this region beyond just one species. So that's what I did the next 10 years. Start training people on, on tracking uh, doing a lot of work in the field, taking a lot of people out to different places, crossing the U.S.-Mexico border back and forth so they could, see, they could see that the habitat is the same there than here, that there's no difference in the habitat, that the fact that they're two different countries only brings up different opportunities and approaches for conservation, not a difference in the animal, right? So yeah. that's what I did. Right. I started yeah. uh, bringing in some indigenous knowledge <clears throat> there. And so, I mean, that, that's a, a huge thing. And again, just before we started this, I was talking about my own shift of thinking that a, a, a true wilderness had no humans in it. And of course, that's just not real. And that's something, yeah. again, I think Western science or a Western mentality has created is drive people out of an area and then it is a national park, a protected area where, of course, for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, depending on where you are. Humans have been part of the landscape. Um, but a, a great example that I know of the indigenous knowledge versus Western science was, and a, and a friend recounted this to me, um, where some people wanted to research aardvarks, the famous African animal that eats exclusively termites, so much so that its teeth have uh, devolving 
they're atrophying. They don't even have dentine. Wow. Any, sorry, they, they have no enamel. So it's just tubes of dentine. They can't chew anything. But what these researchers discovered was in the termite mounds they dig into, at night, occasionally a flower would emerge on the side of it. Uh, and it was pollinated by moths. And if you followed that down, inside the termite mounds were incredibly soft-skinned cucumbers. Mm. There's a lot of cucumbers in Africa. They're typically very bitter, but they're very high in water. Now, if you're an aardvark, going exactly. for a drink is the riskiest point of your life, is going for a drink. That is when lions or perhaps a leopard are going to get you. So if you've got little canisters of water growing right by where your food is, they will eat it. That is the only food that aardvarks eat. It's about less than 1% of their diet, but they also eat these cucumbers that have evolved a soft skin so that a soft toothed animal can eat them. And then of course they defecate their seeds in another termite mound and that allows this thing to propagate. Beautiful relationship between them, uh, commensal relationship, and as they were there having their eureka moment, they'd been using Bushman guides, the sand people of Africa, to guide them around, say, where aardvarks were likely to be. You know, hurrah, we've discovered this. And they said, what are you all excited about? And they showed us. They said, oh, you mean the aardvark cucumber? Yes, exactly. And that was their name for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they knew it. Yeah. <laughs> it was, they, this was not a discovery. Exactly. This is just, yeah, and if they thought to ask these people, and I, I love that story because it, you know, the uh, you know, here's my PhD right here. So like this guy's father, grandfather, great grandfather, back as 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 long as you can go before your tongue runs dry. Yeah. Knew about this. Yes. Uh, same here. I have a great example, and it relates to butterflies specifically. A butterfly mm -hmm. called monarch butterfly. This yep. is a butterfly that makes an annual migration from central to what southern Canada and comes back in the fall to spend the winter in, in Mexico. Uh, of course, this type of migration has been going on for millennia. I don't need to go look for a scientific paper that exactly says what year this migration started. You know, when you see the corridor of flowers, the, the habitat and corridors that they use, the places where they stop, the generations that have to happen, have to pass, for them to reach some places in what's Southern Canada and then come back to Mexico. This has been going on for a long time. And yet we have scientists here in the United States claiming that only 45 years ago, one this one white guy discovered the migration of the monarch. Imagine yeah. how non-humble somebody has to be, how arrogant somebody has to be to say, I discovered the migration of this animal. Really? Like, are you going to tell me that within my life that that that, that it is so new that nobody knew about it? Are you going to tell me that we're now discovering that a uh, 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 wildebeest migrate, that somebody needs to put their name to that, or whales or other things? That's how arrogant do we have to be and yet confident uh, to say these kind of things when Native communities along that migration corridor have developed a relationship with butterflies, have developed stories and culture and language and, and, and uh, art and music and so many other things that relate to the natural connection to a species instead of somebody who just went and wrote it in a paper because he was the first one. You know, like... That is so how do we how do we tap into that indigenous knowledge? Which, if and again, my experience is mainly in Africa, um, where in many places, many communities, and even entire ethnic groups, that knowledge is being lost because it is not valued. Yep. Or it's you know, they perceive it as having no value, and we're certainly seeing that with the Bushmen, who've been completely marginalised. How? Are, are you, by drawing attention to it, do you think you're adding value and that people will keep these stories alive or that perhaps scientists will take the bloody shortcut? Like you could research for 10 years or you could ask the guy that knows, uh, are you finding a shift at all? Um, or are you finding that information is, is being lost before it can be retrieved to the, the broader world? 
like everything with humans, all of the answers apply. I'm finding it moving forward yeah. on some things. I'm finding it resisting in other ways. Okay. Uh, yeah. I am definitely finding that newer generations are where more, where way more open to hearing these things because they are now seeing the impact, what it means to not listen to those communities. But the answer to your question about how we tap into indigenous knowledge um, reflects also a bias. The question would be, how do we listen and follow the leadership of the knowledge holders? So we don't have to have the, know the knowledge in order for things to change. We don't have to uh, go discover or understand that knowledge for others to want. We can be followers too. So that's what I did. And that's what I meant about that revert scientist that you talk about, is that we need to stop being the expert. We need to stop thinking of ourselves as the revert spokesperson. Instead, I can go have another leader. I can, instead of them coming to my organization, so I give them a voice, I go to their community to give them a voice. So we so, have yeah. to we right. have to be comfortable being quiet and not being the last ones with the last word. Because the other thing you just said is there's these researchers spending decades working on something that you could have asked a grandma, right? <laughs> um, but then very commonly when scientists go to communities and they ask questions and they get an answer, then scientists argue those answers, rationalize those answers explain. No, just don't explain anything. Just stay quiet with the knowledge that they are giving you. It makes sense to them. So it's up to us to learn what conditions, what environment, what context they live in for that information to be relevant. They might not have the answer to questions that we want to ask about genetics or, uh, you know, that certain behaviors. But they might have the answer about what networks of food connect to them. So you know that it's not only about the termites, it's also about the cucumbers. And it's so simple. But we need to be humble and allow that knowledge to shower us instead of listen to that knowledge and then try to so, argue or fix it within a context that works for us. So we need to stop being professors and be students for life in a way. And to be quite honest, yes, yes. We need to understand that learning comes in many different ways. In a way, this is going to sound crazy, but in a way, I strongly advocate for people not reading books anymore, for people not reading books written by white men, because then we create this framework where white men somewhere else are deciding how conservation is, are deciding how uh, sort, of, sort of these sciences are. Instead, let's read books uh, or have knowledge from people who, are, who have different life experiences, different backgrounds, different contexts in order for us to understand that there's another way of seeing things that is not the academic scientific world. For example, we need to learn from experience. So you drive a car. Do you, do you ride a bicycle? Uh, it's so hilly where I live right now. Okay. <laughs> I run. run. I run instead. Okay. Yeah. My point, my point, and I like to ask my audiences this, is you ride a bicycle, you drive a car, uh, you use a computer, maybe not use a computer. How many books did you read in order to ride a bicycle, in order to learn how to ride a bicycle? How many books? How many books did you read to learn how to drive a car? You did not. You just learned from experience. You learned from observation. You learned from somebody else communicating with you. But not everything, not all the knowledge comes through books. And it certainly is limited when, when we only read books authored by people whose worldview is limited, then they are passing a limited knowledge too. People need to read books like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie in order to learn that there's more to wildlife in Nigeria than just their beauty or their commercial value, right? Like there's a cultural connection to that. So uh, those are some of the ways that I have been using. But also I stand back and I use my privilege as a man, 
as a heterosexual man, as a scientist, as a bilingual person. And I open the door sometimes. I get invitations where I decide not to speak and bring in somebody else to be the speaker, to open the door for other people and use our privilege wherever we can to allow other knowledge to be shared and not just ours. And also, I think this is something where, you know, with our brief correspondence that we both share is the idea of nature also being a teacher. Sometimes humans, every human should just shut up. Yeah. and let nature do the talking. Uh, it's okay to, to stop and explain or to answer questions. And that's something you're also doing now, isn't it? You, uh, I don't know if this is under the auspices of the Sierra Club or if this yeah. is an individual. It is. Okay, well, but you... uh, uh, for, because my life changed. That's the thing is that yeah. I did a life change. And so uh, it affected my identity. Uh, it affected it affected how I see myself and how I see my family and the knowledge of my grandmas and my aunties. It affected uh, much more than just who I am because of a college degree. It affected how I see the world and how I relate to people. So uh, it's, it's actually of, uh, what, what you're saying now. For me, it's uh, and I've, uh, it's just hit me. It's like someone who's lost a faith. And spend yes. some time searching for a new one. You, yes. Yeah. The, yeah. I lost my faith in science. Uh, hurt by the response of scientists who I admired. Uh, and uh, specifically the res their response to the death of a jaguar. I also was very disenchanted with scientists who, due to their identity, white people, don't get to see the challenges and barriers that exist for non-white people, non-hetero people as scientists. And um, I would hate to get too much into this, but it happened during a time of my life where I, I, I worked at a very highly um, reputable scientific institution here in Tucson, the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it is this natural history museum uh, uh, with animals living in, in open habitats, uh, not cages, but big enclosures. And it is this natural history museum that represents the ecosystems of this region in the United States and Mexico, the Sonoran Desert, etc. cetera. Uh, and the mission that they have is to inspire people to live in harmony in the desert. So great. It's very educational. It's uh, eye opening. And you know, you're going to go see bears and deer and pumas, which you really don't see when you just walk in the wild. Mm -hmm. So a great place when you see it like that. But I realized that by being the only scientist of color, I was feeding a quota for them. I was being a little mm -hmm. bit of a prop for them to say, look, we have a Mexican scientist. But when this Mexican scientist Stop being a, a scientist and was a Mexican person, then they were uncomfortable with that, specifically around the construction of the border wall, specifically about immigration policies that racially profile people coming to this country. Which, which wall? Which wall? Because there's been a few, haven't there? Well, the one. Because it's, okay. it's only yeah, right. one border. It's only one border. So it's yeah. whatever, California, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, the yeah. same one. It's the same policy. Uh, and these scientists were telling me, you need to not be so political. We don't want to talk about politics. Well, I'm seeing that my people are put in cages, separated from their families. They are having to migrate from places where climate change and oil and gas extraction have destroyed their places of living and they come to ask for refuge and they're, they're treated as criminals. Well, I am one of them. I come from those communities. I also had dreams. They also had dreams like me. I grew up in privilege, so we didn't migrate, but I'm those people. So when this highly reputable institution and scientists did not respond to me as a person, they love that I talk about Jaguars, but they don't love that I talk about migration of people, you know? I, could I think those, those uh, are so intrinsically linked with cons conservation as well. I mean, if you're concerned about Jaguars in Bolivia, 
you might want to make sure that there's future biologists in Bolivia to make sure that the jaguars exist, right? Instead of just thinking, well, everybody's going to migrate. Who's going to take care of the jaguars? Who's going to run the studies? Who's going to be the governor or the president or the natural resources secretary, right? Like if we don't see the connection between wildlife conservation and people and the needs that people have to stay in their homes and continue those lives, we're missing the point. So I could not work in that place where I was very respected as a, respected as a scientist, but as a person, they didn't want me to open my mouth. That made me not want to be a scientist. That made me leave the world of science in order to look for a much broader world where I could inspire and connect and relate and relate to youth before they are in their science career. You know, when they are still deciding what direction they want to go. I wanted to share my story to tell them you can do, you can be uh, the person you want to be and also be aware that there's other frameworks, there's other ways of thinking that you could also be using. And actually they're closer to you than you think. They come from your uh, community. So would you, from would, you steer, would you steer young people of a non-white background, of a non-heterosexual male background, Yep. But the, the, the tip of the pyramid there, would you steer them away from science because of the prejudice they're going to encounter or would you just warn them of it? Uh, it's very difficult to answer yes or no with this or that, right? Like that is another thing in our world. We make everything very binary, <laughs> including the way we ask things. We just give two options. I let people choose what they want to do, but if they are a gender non-conforming individual, I want them to be a scientist because their voice is important, their life experience, their connection to nature is very important, and they need to not fit in as a heterosexual white scientist. They need to belong as a non as a gender non-conforming individual. They have a voice as a scientist like that. This is why Black Lives Matter, not because all the other lives don't matter, but because specifically the experience of black people needs to be recognized as something that we need to care for and protect. So I'm not saying don't be a scientist. I'm saying go be a scientist that you are. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't imitate somebody else. And Jane, don't Jane let the constraints <clears throat> of academia make you be somebody else. Jane Goodall, I, I know, again, she's white, obviously, and she was English, and there, there's a lot of privileges for me, but she was yes. not from a wealthy background. But she ruffled a lot of feathers. Yes. Um, and yet, as far as, and, and I, I could be correct on this, but as far as I know, she's one of only three people in Oxford University's entire history that have been granted a PhD without a degree. But they've, uh, they've granted nice. And and it was entirely because she came into it without the the blinkers the, or the shackles of conventional science. And yeah. I've always enjoyed that because I my education stopped early. I a number of reasons I had to leave home and school young, just got into work and was very fortunate to find the career I've got. So I have always said, given the time again, I would want to be in science communication. I think the world needs that desperately now. And I, I believe you're a science communicator and in a way I, I hope that I am. And I think many of my colleagues who've grown up in a village in Botswana and have never seen the ocean in their lives are science communicators yeah. because every single day they're speaking to tourists. And I, I think that that's in a very important role. And, and a lot of what you're saying resonates and it's, it's both disheartening and heartening at the same time to go back to being binary um to hear that it's occurring in the united states in mexico these prejudices that are are people are facing and making their lives more challenging i've spoken to a lot of women in, in science and of course they front review boards of you know long beards you know, beard stroking men that's got to change i i do though feel there is a place still for that knowledge 
But what you've mentioned a few times and I'm starting to take on board is perhaps we drop the reverence. Now, the more you look like Charles Darwin, the more we need to understand exactly. your prejudices. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think we need to view every single answer they give and every single shackle they try to put on through the lens of their prejudice. And I say that with, with understanding and admiration for Charles Darwin, who was born just over where my right shoulder, 800 metres from where I am right now, is, nice. is the house he was born in. Um, but, I mean, he would have no place in science today for a start. Yeah. And, yeah, so I, I think it, uh, you're actually opening my eyes to a lot of ideas here. But something I want to come back to is you, you and, and it's it's perhaps a lighter side, and this is we, we've had a, a fairly heavy and serious conversation, but, again, I've got the feeling we, we both appreciate the lighter side. I mean, you have a, a morpho butterfly on one side and a black panther mask on the other. Exactly. That, to me, is what science is. Yes. It's extraordinary things and fun. You know, yeah. it's, it's fun, you know, in, enjoy it and, and, and have fun with it. So there was something I, I read uh, that, that you'd written uh, and it was about people setting out on hikes. Um, what's an absolute essential for people to bring on a hike? Uh, curiosity. Or, curiosity, okay. <laughs> and, and tech-wise, what is their must-have thing that they should bring tech-wise? Nothing. Right, so, yeah. Again, um, it's something I talk about. I am dressed like this. <sighs> yeah. yep. And I often crack, you know, this is just because if you are changing a tire on a car, the dirt doesn't show as much. <laughs> the animals are colorblind. They don't care. Bring your Hawaiian shirt. Yep. In fact, the patterning on it probably lets you blend in more than this uniform. Yeah. Col color palette. So what is the silliest thing? that you have seen people wearing or, or bringing on a hike as essential tech? You know, that's a tough question because I see a lot of silly things. Um, and let me just say, I am in the United States where gear, technology, and the commodification of nature um, mm -hmm. is a thing, like right? So, yeah. So 10 years ago, having a, GP, a GPS unit was a luxury for some of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, whoa, like 10 years ago, you could buy your little Garmin and you could find seven numbers that told you where you are. And now we have cell phones that not only tell you where you are, they show you the map, the topography, the, all those things. So we have developed a lot of tools, but we've also developed, oh, you know, uh, trekking poles of a certain weight and uh, trekking poles, like grab a fucking stick. Uh, <laughs> you know, like... Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So, huh? so it's very difficult because every time I go out there, I see a new thing. Like, yeah, I get it. People have their orange that kind of find their the spot. So they if they go into remote places, they don't get lost. Mm -hmm. But you're here like an hour from the city that you don't need that thing. Um, um, it's interesting how the nature community, the people who enjoy nature, they, they call themselves outdoor community. Uh, it's a lot about having a lot of techie things and yet criticizing others for what they, for how they don't fit this description. So mm -hmm. a lot of white people will criticize uh, people of color because of the food they bring to nature when they sit down to have a chat. A lot of white people like to have granola bars and gorp and all of these seeds that none of us eat. Like we eat tortillas and we eat beans and we eat fruit so bring that <laughs> yeah so it's a lot about the camouflage and the the glasses and the uh the the watches that shine <laughs> the tech shirts that wick your sweat who cares none of that gives you a better experience in nature uh it just makes you feel better uh you know it's like if you are going to enjoy nature and the place it's friendly enough for you to not wear shoes don't wear them that is a way to connect if uh you want to connect with nature and are wearing headphones you are missing three quarters of the experience right we can talk about gear so much but the opposite side of that is let's start doing this uh 
outings and these adventures into nature and these connecting of people who haven't had that privilege through a much simpler way. Let's demystify what it is to go to nature. In fact, I, I mentioned earlier, it is called the, the, the outdoors. I feel outdoors is an acknowledgement that the word outdoors is an acknowledgement that we live our life inside And we only go to nature because it's outdoors. You know, like our life is done inside a place, indoors. But then if you want to go to nature, that's outdoors. But some of us have lived in a way where life happens inside and outside, right? Like the kitchen might be outside. Taking care of the farm animals is outside. Having classes in the school might be outside. Learning experiences are outside. So why do we have to make a difference between indoors and outdoors We also have nature indoors. We don't have to have natural na national parks. We can have nature that lives with us indoors. So this idea of creating the binary indoor-outdoor uh, gives us this thing like you're stepping into a whole different world. You're not. It's, you know, it can be your garden and you don't need special boots for that. I, yeah, I, again, I mean, I... When I go on safari now, I typically, I just wear the same shoes that I run in. They're really comfortable. <laughs> They're really yeah. comfortable and, yeah. uh, you know, they've got a thick sole so thorns don't go through them so far. And, you know, a pair of old trainers, it's perfectly good. I don't need, I, I, I mean, I often make the, the joke that most people, they dress for safari as if it's 1939 and they're on their way to Poland. A special hat and yeah. But yeah, yeah. So here's the other thing though. It's not only what we wear. It's not only how comfortable those trainers are or what you wear. It's also the image you present and the barriers you create. So for some of us, I've never been to a safari. I really struggle with the idea. I want to go, but I don't want to go. I want to go for what's outside of the car. I don't want to go for what's inside of the car because it makes me feel that I don't have enough cameras, lenses, tripods, video, like I feel I don't fit in because I don't have all that equipment. So when we uh, decide to wear something, use something, it's not only how we feel about it, it's the image that we project to other people that think that that's the way you enjoy nature. That only if you have the big camera lens, that's the only way you'll be able to enjoy leopards and cheetahs. Uh, that only if Uh, you have that camouflage clothing is the way that you'll be able to get in a jeep uh, to go see lions, right? No, it is not. You just have to be there. You just have to be present. And all the other gadgetry has nothing to do with your experience and much less with who you are. It doesn't make you better or worse. Well, a great example of that, uh, again, personal experiences, the number of people in there dressed in camo but they're wearing eye-watering levels of perfume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So, okay, so you're trying to blend in, are you? Yeah. Uh, but you 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 smell like a frangipani factory exploding. And they drive, or they drive in a way when they park, they make a lot of noise. You know, they come out making a lot of noise. It's like wildlife already ran away. It doesn't matter if you're wearing camo. We can hear your car coming the, down the hill for three kilometers. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, again, that's that image. And it's, I'm not actually wanting to believe, I, I want everybody to get into nature and be inspired by it, or at least if they're not, to go, this is not for me and I'll stay inside and good. Please do then. Um, there are certain places in the world that cannot bear the weight of human interest. Uh, deserts in particular, which you've spoken of, so yeah. fragile. The Arctic. Um, the Arctic, yeah, the Antarctic. Um, so the, both those environments, they're very, very sensitive. So, uh, again, we don't need people going and shopping at their local gear store and turning up with their, their lightweight sticks with an extra springy spike that goes straight through a penguin egg. Um, and much yeah. less to think that, By buying all that stuff, you're supporting conservation also. You not only don't need all that stuff to be part of nature and enjoy the penguins, also, let's not necessarily buy the capitalistic argument that by supporting your outdoor store, then you're supporting the conservation 
of animals locally. Honestly, I, ha I struggle with that. And it is a capitalistic model. So this is where my feelings about safari comes in. I get it that it leaves uh, funds locally, but I argue that the percentage of money produced by safari versus the percentage of money that has an impact in local communities is very different. And um, it is a capitalistic model. So I think that would depend upon where it is and the operator. Sure. Um, there's there's a lot of really good operators out there that are doing. Uh, there's there's one company I'm not at all involved with it, uh, and they're operating in Zimbabwe. And every day they feed something like two thousand Zimbabwean kids uh, to keep them in school. The the food is given at school, and it encourages the parents <clears throat> who often don't have the means to feed the kids to send yeah. them there because they're getting at least two meals a day. And that's the kind of thing where you go, oh yeah, there's there's other. The construction's all concrete. Yeah. yeah uh, but on I the other hand, they go back. So. Yeah, I want to counter argue that though, because for example, here in the States, people give a lot of credit to Bill Gates, the Windows guy, who is multi billionaire, for yeah. giving, giving back to the community millions of dollars for schools, millions of dollars for uh, laptops, millions of dollars for this and that. But to be quite honest, those millions of dollars are a little pinch in the funds of Bill Gates. They're not representative of the profit that he's making. And two, at least here, those funds are not just making doing a favor to those communities. Those funds are tax deductible for the person who is making this donation. So he still gets a benefit on top of the benefit. So yes, there might be a company who leaves a lot of local impact into local communities. But what is the percentage of that local impact compared to the profit that they are making? That's where the conversation is. It's not about the, how much they're living here, it's how much they're keeping and how much they're benefiting by arguing that they're living all this. But, you know, we can keep going. Uh, okay, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the, long, the long conversation of greenwashing, yeah. which you tell them all. <laughs> yes. Um, and, I mean, I, I think, again, it varies from place to place because, again, so sort of, I've heard trophy hunters arguing that they do so much more for conservation right. than photographic tourism, and they believe their arguments. They, yes. don't, they don't think that they're lying. They, they have not created a lie to present to the world. They believe what they are yeah. saying, just as I believe what I'm saying. And again, it always comes back to you having lost your faith in science. This is one of those, we all have a faith. It does not, it's not necessarily a religious one. Yeah. And, and capitalism a, is a religion. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Um, the fantastic book sapiens talks yes. about that. There you go. Um, yeah. Which and then England. you realize how much that book have much more detractors because this book is dismantling a narrative. So the book kind of has more detractors than people who really celebrate it, what this book brings up. It's like whenever you go counter narrative, oh, everybody comes out to say how, no, like you're wrong. Like you, we need to keep doing this. Um, so it, it is also a result of that model. Like I said, I'm, I'm a fan of science and and... I think any scientist who's made a major breakthrough, I think the first response to their work is typically to be ridiculed. And uh, again, if we go back to Darwin, he actually sat on his idea for decades. Um, and it, one, you know, one thing was because he didn't, he knew that the species evolved. He didn't understand how he didn't have the mechanism of sexual selection, but also he knew the furor it was going to cause, particularly sensitive thing going against the church. So you've got to wonder how many great ideas are left on the table. Yeah. Uh, I'm, glad is, you bring that up. I'm so glad you bring that up. And like you said, I also am a fan of science. I love science. But what ideas are we leaving outside of the table when we only look at science? My influence mm -hmm. was very scientific. My way of thinking was very scientific. So I never, ever growing up thought about art as part of conservation. I never really appreciated other forms of relating to nature that have nothing to do with science and yet have everything to do with that relationship of people and, and wildlife, people and nature. So if I stay on my scientific world, 
I'll never know what this is, what it entails, what it represents, where it comes from, how it's made. I'll never understand the indigenous name of the ocelot and what uh, stories there are. So yes, again, science as a tool is really good, but it's really limited if we don't look outside of it. So that, that's going to be what should probably be the last question, um, because otherwise we, I think we agree we could both be here for several hours, is with the new track you have taken, have there, I'm sure there have been many revelations or, or, you know, the wow moments where you, you've learned something. What, what is a standout or a recent standout perhaps of something where you've just thought, this is something I never would have learned if I'd stayed on the scientific railroad tracks? Yeah. That, that, that defined path. Yeah. When I was on the scientific railroad tracks, I knew the publications, the authors, the universities, the papers, the studies, the dates, the locations. I know, every, I know everything about Pumas. I can tell you. I'm very comfortable saying I have a really good grasp at the research and science produced about Pumas and Jaguars. I'm not going to call myself an expert, but I'm very well informed. However, once I went out of those tracks, I started learning more about indigenous communities' connection to Jaguars, not the scientific publications, right? I started learning about origin stories that connect to mythical animals. Uh, I started learning about knowledge, about seasons, about groups of people uh, that is not written and that is passed through stories. And the thing that has uh, really been helpful to me in science, when you write something, you discover something, you write a paper and your peers review it to say, strengthen this, take this out, improve this. Okay, so you have peers that are telling you how to make that better. So outside of science, I have found peers who have told me, thank you for bringing up the issues and stories of native communities that are not seen in the, in the scientific circles, that are not talked about. So I'd receive feedback from who I think are my peers are native women indigenous people who come to me without knowing me and say, hey, I watched that podcast with Peter Allison and it was awesome how you fought him about capitalism. Thank you for doing that. So that peer uh, comments has given yep. me a lot of energy, has given me enthusiasm to dare to be uncomfortable in conversations with some people because it means that other people are feeling seen and heard and their stories are finally coming out and I don't have to be the one telling them. I can invite them to tell them. So right now, when, when I feel the best is when Native people say, thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that national parks were created to protect nature, but it, nobody knows Indigenous communities were removed or killed to protect those places in order for Yellowstone National Park, the Grand Canyon National Park, Yosemite National Park, and many other national parks in this country, in order for those to exist and be the beautiful natural gems that they are, actually white people came and removed native communities, removing the culture, the language, the food, the music, the art, and instead just leaving empty natural spaces. When they came uh, to this continent, they saw communities, uh, large groups of bison, beavers, wolves, jaguars, and then they wanted to protect the places so they wouldn't disappear. But they never understood that it was because the stewardship of indigenous communities that bison and beavers and wolves live in harmony with each other, that they lived in harmony with nature. It was white people who came to remove humans in order to create these parks. So That's when I see the world this, over, I, I think, when, yeah. When I see this that makes possibly you and other people uncomfortable, I will have native people coming and saying, thank you for making them uncomfortable and bringing in a different truth that is not regularly said in scientific or conservation circles. I think uh, perhaps older white people are uncomfortable. I mean, I'm, I'm no spring chicken myself, you know, they're, but it's something which is, it is history. It is perhaps not the history that I was taught at school. Correct. But it is without, without a doubt emerging now. I mean, there, 
We go back to a false narrative at school. I was told about Captain Cook discovering Australia when it was actually, it's, it was, there were people living in Australia before there were people living in the UK. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, what a, a, a load of poppycock, as an English person might say. Interesting. Um, and, and similarly with the stories of national parks, the, the people that founded them were treated as heroes. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do believe that their intention was good for wildlife. And I, I'm a little cautious of judging people really harshly for what they did in the past, unless it's somebody thoroughly like, you know, like a King Leopold or a, a Stanley, just turds uh, by any by any historical lens. And I, I'm I'm not uncomfortable. The the only discomfort I feel in hearing that is because it's horrible. It should never have happened. Right. I don't. I, I don't feel I've got to deny it or defend it. Definitely don't feel it's, it needs defending. Excellent. And I think it's, it's these are important. Yeah, they're important stories to be told, but it's fantastic that they have a voice through someone that sounds and looks like you rather than me. And I yeah. think that's the real yeah. issue. And we all play a part. Um, I wouldn't be able to share this if you didn't invite me to a podcast, right? So... I can be all this super knowledgeable, greatly eloquent person, but hey, I'm in a room. If there's no audience for me, if somebody else doesn't share a platform for me to speak, so we're helping each other. That's our role. That's what I'm saying. Yep. Uh, <coughs> kind of science, commu science communication. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. The other part about it is that you are understanding that what I'm saying about white men is not you but it is a historic context of something that in fact happened right and you're talking about the history that wasn't taught here in the united states people in school learn history starting in the 1800s maybe the 1700s hell my town where i grew up in zacatecas was founded in the 1600s so it's a pretty old town already colonized place and it has a tremendous Long, tremendously long indigenous history. So yes, it is about the history that we learn, the, the barriers, the mental barriers that we create, that we think from 1492 to here is history and from 1491 back, it's prehistory. Who says? Who? who oh, wow, I didn't know it was defined like that, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, <clears throat> so let me tell you, it's like, it's not like it's defined like that, but in our regular language, that's how a lot of people talk. A lot of people talk about history, as far as I can see, my generations. But if the, if we if we weren't here, then that's prehistory. Well, indigenous communities who have been here for millennia don't like to hear the word prehistory because they are not prehistoric. They are part of history. Here's another thing. You mentioned how Cook did not discover Australia. There were people living there for a longer time than even there were people in England. And let's be honest, these people were not primitive. They were not surviving. They were highly uh, involved, engaged societies thriving in this environment. So let's forget about this idea that native people are primitive and that their knowledge is primitive and that they were surviving. Actually, imagine living in this desert uh, and being able to live and thrive in a place where it gets between 50 degrees in the summer and minus 10 or 15 in the winter, yeah. uh, right? And so knowledge is not primitive. People are not primitive. I actually challenge anybody with all those gadgets and all that experience to survive uh, a little bit in the wild, wherever we want to go and notice what kind of knowledge we have to have in order to really thrive and think about generations in, in history of our families. Yeah, I think that's a great, I mean, uh, it reflects the thing I was reading just today where, so we're thriving at the moment apparently, and yet 50% of our calories come from three grains, uh, rice, wheat, and I, I'm, of course I'm failing on the other one, uh, but that's 50% of our calories. Well, that's insane again. Yeah prehistorically if we if you throw that label to it far greater diversity of food sources available to people so again it, it, going back to what we we're saying earlier what are we losing and it's it's a great great shame that we are losing indigenous knowledge we're losing indigenous foods 
Yeah. And it's something I, I talk about a lot, the, the importance of these things. Um, we have run quite a, a long way here. Um, I've got to actually rescue my wife from three children. Uh, <laughs> That's privilege. <laughs> um, That's privilege. But I, I, before I go, thank you so much for coming on, and I'm sure we are going to chat further. And I would love to come and join you on one of your walks or hikes in Tucson. Is, is there a way, is there something you would like to recommend people read or where they can join you or, or learn more about what you're doing? Where should they go for that? I would love to invite people to follow my social media. That would be an easy one. So if you don't mind sharing in the notes uh, of the video, but I can say that I'm on social media at Sergio underscore Concolor, C-O-N-C-O-L-O-R. Uh, it's the, the second half of the scientific name of the puma. Exactly. And my yeah. email is the other way around. Is Puma underscore Avila. I did first name and last name on that. Um, Puma is my favorite cat. Uh, yeah, anyway. But also the con color thing uh, has to do with being a person of color and having that context and those opinions. So you will find that in my social media. Right now, because of the pandemic, our outings at Sierra Club are not as dynamic and extended as we would like to. Um, but I invite people to visit Sierra Club uh, if you are in the United States or have a contact with a specific state in the States, uh, go to their chapter. So the state of California, the state of Arizona, the state of Massachusetts, you might be able to find their local chapter and they will have more information. And right. overall, I will say just invite people to look for different authors. You know, I'm not the only one talking about these things. Start learning about the intersection of environmental justice and social justice as a way to see examples of how supporting people supports the environment. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Thanks so much, Sergio. This has been very educational for me as well and, and eye-opening. And I, I do find every single one of these is, and it's, it's great that that's carrying on. Um, and what a fantastic way to bring this podcast back. Thank you Thank very you. much. What a pleasure. Muchas gracias.